I'd like to tell you the story behind my film, Primate Cinema, Apes as Family. It's a film made expressly for a chimpanzee audience. And the project is an art and science experiment about interspecies communication. The project began when I learned that chimpanzees in retirement homes watch television as a form of enrichment. I learned about this in a Charles Siebert article in the New York Times, which um, chronicles chimpanzees that have been retired from their lives as laboratory specimen, which get to go to an, a sanctuary in Louisiana, which is federally funded by the Chimpanzee Act. And um, there they have an outdoor enclosure that you can see where they can socialize during the day. And at night, they have individual bedrooms which are outfitted with televisions. And one chimpanzee apparently had a favorite television show, and this was General Hospital. <laughs> I was flummoxed by this, this image of a chimpanzee watching television. Um, what was it that appealed about this particular show. And Siebert wrote that it was actors in laboratory coats, those white lab coats, which may have reminded them of being raised in laboratories by scientists, um, which, is a, which is a tragic thought. Um, however, as a filmmaker, I was really intrigued by the idea what kind of film would call out to chimpanzees? What kind of cinematography, what kind of sound and light, what props, what story would appeal to a chimpanzee mind? And I started to work on this idea thanks to the Arts Catalyst, which is basically a dating service for artists and scientists to work together. They put me in touch with a, com a comparative psychologist whose Specialty is looking at human and chimpanzee facial expressions and emotions. Um, I should tell you more about the concept behind making a film for chimpanzees. Um, once, once I have this film for chimpanzees, then I imagine that um, if we were watching the film at the same time as the chimpanzees, then we could triangulate to imagine what chimpanzees' minds were like. So the idea was to shoot a drama for chimpanzees, then document the, the chimpanzees watching the film, and then show it to a human audience. And this, my goal was to dislodge an anthropocentric way of viewing the world and to create something really totally other. So flash forward, I meet this wonderful primatologist. Um, she works in Edinburgh, Scotland, with the largest group of captive chimpanzees in all of Europe, who knew? Um, and I started to do research for the project to make this film for chimps. So I, I talked to everybody who I could find who'd worked with chimpanzees before, and they basically show them television shows that they like, and they think that chimpanzees would like. So they had, um, well, they showed drumming, or they showed cooking shows like Iron Chef. Uh, they showed Teletubbies because they thought that chimpanzees liked looking at human infants. And you can see that human infant rising at the beginning of the Teletubbies show. Um, and of course, they showed them wildlife films of chimpanzees doing chimpanzee behaviors. What was sort of interesting to me was reading an article that said that zookeepers who act like chimpanzees get more friendly reactions from chimps in, in their feeding and in the sort of work that they have to do with chimps at the zoo. So I decided to work with a bunch of actors in Los Angeles and we put them in chimpanzees' costumes and acted out a number of different social dramas for chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, um, you know, we didn't get a uh, run-in by the police while we were shooting these things in the, the former premises of the LA Zoo. Um, one other thing I tried was I talked to a market researcher to see whether um, human audiences or chimpanzee audiences could be 
um, mind read, to know whether they were enjoying something or not interested in something without having to ask them. Because I thought if there were some kind of cool scientific device that could register um, animals' physiology, um, you know, I, I could short circuit this whole project, it would make it a lot easier. But he said no. So we went to Scotland with a lot of different videos to show the chimpanzees. And I'll, I'll show you the very first time that the chimps actually saw our, our show for them at the zoo. And this is the, um, this is the research pod at the Edinburgh Zoo where zoo visitors can watch through the same window and, um, and scientists work behind those plexiglass windows there. We had this theory that we could compare a show on monitor A and sh monitor B over there and see what the chimps were most interested in watching. You can see that they're really um, a physical audience that's, uh, you know, they express themselves so much non-verbally when they're interested in something. You can see them really getting interested. <laughs> and, um, so I learned so much about chimpanzees by spending time with them. I, I started to, they registered on an individual level. I knew some of them by their names. We knew that Edith and Eva loved watching television. The two of them, mother and daughter, would sit and watch, um, uh, actually, the human actors uh, doing a sex scene. Um, <laughs> a, a chimpanzee sex scene, I should say, in costume. Um, they loved, they loved that sequence, so it, it wound up in the final film. Um, and of course, when we showed the final film, Edith and Eva both were having sexual swelling, so they became much more popular than the film itself. So you never know what's going to happen when you work with animals. Um, what else? I also learned um, that these particular chimps came from such different backgrounds that well, it would be impossible to make one film that would appeal to all of them. I mean, some were raised by scientists in labs. Others had been raised in the zoo, and they had been trained in tea parties back in a previous generation of zoo culture when chimps were, were in zoos having tea in Scotland. Um, another chimp was raised on a sailboat that traveled around Africa, and other chimps were probably from the wild and may have lost their, their parents um, who were killed in order to, to take those infants and bring them to other countries as, as pets or as um, zoo specimen or lab specimen. They have very tragic stories behind them. Um, but, but more than this, I learned about the, you know, the social dynamics of chimpanzees. They're, of course, a very sophisticated, intelligent species that's very emotional, like us, our closest relatives. Um, and what would happen in these spaces when we showed television was, was any number of dominance displays or conflicts over um, food or territory. Um, so, so we had a lot to compete with when we were showing these these films, and had this been a science experiment, we would have isolated each individual chimpanzee and shown him television, and then we would have isolated each individual variable in filmmaking and tested each one out. But that was not what I wanted to do, and I'm not a scientist, I'm an artist, so I wanted to combine different aspects of filmmaking to entertain these chimpanzees, and I didn't want to make it an uncomfortable experience for them. Here's another moment, which I think was really important. Um, here on the left, you see um, uh, an alpha male at the Los Angeles Zoo in a display behavior. And on the right, you'll see the Edinburgh chimps watching it on this monitor over here. You can see at the LA Zoo that there's a human audience watching the chimpanzee drama playing out. 
And then the Scottish chimp is basically doing a display behavior himself in response to what he's seen on television. So, first of all, I was really afraid. What's going on here? Have I, have I um, disturbed the chimpanzees by showing them on something on, on television? The zookeepers assured me that display behavior is a natural behavior which happens many times a day in the wild and also in captivity. Um, this brought up all sorts of questions. First of all, I think display behavior is a really interesting one to think about because um, when you make yourself look really big and impressive and um, you, know, you run around and make a lot of noise and try to get attention, try to be threatening, um, it's, a, it's a display but it's also a way of avoiding actual physical confrontation that chimpanzees can use um, to make themselves uh, more powerful in the group. It's also a primitive form of theater, isn't it? It's a representation of power rather than the exertion of power. That's a pretty good social behavior. Um, it also suggests that maybe watching narratives is something that chimpanzees like or maybe our common ancestor with chimpanzees would also need to watch because you have, to, you have to watch the end of a fight, right? You want to know who won. You want to know if there was violence in the end. You want to know where that guy is gone so that you can run away. Um, so as a filmmaker, thinking about making the film for the chimps, this was also really important. Maybe we could do a narrative despite the chimpanzee's short attention span. Um, what else about this? It suggests that the, the that the chimpanzees were watching programming and they were getting something from it. So, so what did we do? Um, basically, I went back to the, the drawing board and I, and I wanted to come up with a script. Um, we would wind up shooting 22 minutes of uh, programming for chimpanzees and it was really a variety show given that we would have at the very best, maybe five minutes of chimpanzees watching video at a time. But this, the story structure I chose was something like The Wizard of Oz. It follows an adolescent female chimpanzee as she leaves her home and meets a bunch of vaudevillian strangers on a journey, a kind of coming of age story. And in fact, this is what happens with young adolescent female chimpanzees in the wild. They are a patrilineal society, so the males stay with their family for their whole lives, but the females have to leave their group and they have to integrate with another community um, somewhere else. So they have to investigate new territories, they ingratiate themselves in the new community, basically by having a lot of sex with a lot of the males, and doing childcare for the females. Um, and this is an experience that a captive chimpanzee would not be able to have. Um, so I hope that the video would open up new frontiers for the chimpanzees. And I also wanted to make something for the young female chimpanzee demographic. <laughs> um, <laughs> other influences in this script were reading about chimps that had grown up with human culture. They were enculturated. A lot of chimps have to be abandoned by the age of five from, you know, they have to leave their human families because they become unruly. That's why it's unethical to have chimpanzees as actors um, because they live to be maybe 60 years old. The rest of their lives have to be spent in some kind of cage. Um, there's a story of a chimp that was bequeathed to a lab after it had been in somebody's home and it escaped from the lab and what did it do with its freedom? It broke into a human home, opened the refrigerator, got out some snacks, went to bed and watched TV. <laughs> and this is, a, this is one of the scenes that makes it into the film. Well, I'll show you the, the opening of the film. 
um, in a minute. Uh, I do want to say that a chimpanzee by himself is not a chimp. This had to be a social drama. It would be a, it would be a primate drama that included conflicts over territory, alliances, sex, and food. And these were our wonderful cast. Um, and, and also a, a very skillful actor in a, an animatronic suit that was controlled, where her facial expressions were controlled by two puppeteers. Sort of an interesting acting unit. We installed a 50-inch monitor inside the outdoor enclosure of the Edinburgh Zoo. And we also set up the monitor as well as a bunch of um, cameras to capture the chimpanzees' reactions. So here is the opening of the film. And I like to think of this as the Stanley Kubrick 2001 moment where the chimps are coming out to see this obelisk for the first time. And they are seeing it for the first time. They're coming out in the morning on an unusually bright and sunny Edinburgh morning. And you can hear the wah barks of the chimps, which is their alarm call which are setting off the, the sound of the gibbons, another ape that was in an enclosure nearby the chimps. Um, another, another sequence from the film shows um, a real close-up on a chimpanzee as it's watching a, a social drama. I'll show you this. So you're seeing the, the chimpanzee watching side by side with the, the film that it's watching. <laughs> so you're left with the image of people watching chimpanzees watching television. And what are we to make of this? In a way, I think we think of television as being an artifact of human culture, um, maybe tantamount to our, our technical abilities, um, somehow an extension of our, our abstract thinking and, and linguistic abilities. Um, but in another sense, we can think of television as already existing in the jungle well before human beings invented the cathode ray tube. Because if you think about chimpanzees, they have to constantly monitor each other, and so do human beings, in order to be successful as, as social animals. If you think about um, all of the things that we put on Facebook, we're, we're listing our, our age, our gender, our sexual availability, whether we found good food, our kinship relations, all of these sorts of things all of the Facebook basics are the basics of, of human and primate social life. So in the end, I guess I want to leave you with the thought that humans and chimpanzees both have to be good primatologists in order to be good social beings. We have to watch each other, study each other, and learn in order to get along. Thank you. <laughs>